Okay, some would say probably the most realistic market structure that we study is that of oligopoly. Let's look at the characteristics of oligopoly. What is an oligopoly? Well, in this market structure there are a few very large dominant firms. So if we looked at an N-firm concentration ratio, the figure we would get would be very high, typically towards 75%, 80%, meaning that whatever number of firms that are in the market, the few large ones that are dominating, that's three, five firms, seven firms, they together control the market. They have a very dominant um, control over the market. Market shares are very high. So a few large firms dominating. Good industries, I make this point, you know, the petrol retailing industry, you've got the airline industry, uh, these are all big examples of the oligopoly where a few large firms are dominant. Uh, in the UK, the banking industry is another good example. There are very high barriers to entry and exit, especially sunk costs tend to be very high in oligopoly. You tend also to have high capital costs and startup costs, uh, with also brand loyalty as well as a major barrier to entry. So very high barriers to entry. There is product differentiation though, so firms do have price making power. Um, this is very important in oligopoly, this notion of interdependence. What that means, very simply, is that any time a firm makes a decision, that firm must consider the likely reactions of its rivals before actually making the decision. That's important because there is a lot of uncertainty. These few firms that are dominating are trying to kind of get ahead of each other. They're trying to gain as much market share themselves as possible. So when they make a decision, they must consider how their rivals are likely to react before making that decision. That's known as interdependence. One decision is based on the reactions of another one. So that's the, uh, a key characteristic in oligopoly here. And because of that, we tend to see very rigid prices, prices staying the same. I'll talk about that in a second. We see a lot of non-price competition because price competition actually is very bad, um, especially in terms of brand, uh, building a brand image and advertising. These are the key ways firms try to compete on non-price factors. And we also assume again that firms are profit maximizers, but there is a big element of firms looking to gain market share too. So maybe there are times where profit max isn't always applicable in this scenario here. Okay, so let's move on to conduct. I'm going to focus on one theory in this video, and then game theories focus on another video. But this theory I'm going to look at is kinked demand curve theory. And it takes all these characteristics together and it tries to map a reason behind price rigidity. So this is one understanding behind why prices are rigid, and it comes back to this notion of interdependence. So, how does this actually work? Well, it starts with an assumption that firms are settled, or have settled, on a price. Okay, I'm going to call that price P1. So at price P1, there is also a quantity of Q1. Right. The idea is that at price P1, the demand curve around it is kinked. Okay? It's kinked, very elastic above, and very inelastic below P1. This is the idea. Now, why is that the case? So, obviously, it's called kinked demand curve because of this kinked demand curve that we've drawn here, which is actually two demand curves stuck together. The point we're trying to make here is that it doesn't make sense for firms to go away from this price P1. It makes sense for the firm to stay, keep prices rigid at P1. Because if the firm tried to raise its price, well, what are the, react what are the uh, uh, other firms in the market going to do? The rivals. Well, they're not going to follow. The rivals are going to keep their price lower. Therefore, this firm is going to lose a massive amount of market share and probably lose a lot of profit too. And that's shown by a very elastic demand curve above P1 tries to raise its price, consumers will just simply leave this firm and consume elsewhere where the prices are lower. So it doesn't make sense for the firm to raise its price. It also doesn't make sense for this firm to reduce its price because demand is very inelastic below P1. So they're not gonna, this firm is not going to gain a huge number of consumers by reducing its price because what are its rivals going to do? They're just going to follow. They're going to also either match the lower price or try and undercut the lower price. Therefore, all we're going to see if this firm decides to lower its price is a massive price war. And that's terrible for this firm because what happens? Well, it actually loses profits. Quantity doesn't increase very much, but the price falls massively. 
Okay? And market share is not going to change very much at all. So reducing price is pointless too. So the elastic curve above the price and the inelastic curve below the price tells you that this firm should keep its price at P1. It makes sense to do so. So that's one of the main reasons behind the price rigidity, according to King demand curve theory. But using this uh, diagram, using this theory, we can actually um, have another understanding behind why prices are rigid. Now, if we look to plot the marginal revenue curve here, well, we know marginal revenue is just twice as steep as average revenue. So if we try to plot that, it would look something like this, so twice as steep. But now, something special happens. We know that these are two curves stuck together. So again, the marginal revenue curves will be two curves. And what happens is that we see a vertical intersection here, so which I'm just going to connect using a vertical line. The reason is that at this point, at this quantity level, the two curves do not actually intersect. Okay? Hence, there's discontinuity. If you want to understand why that's the case, watch my video on why there is a vertical section in the marginal revenue curve. And the point being made here is that even if costs increase, so let's say marginal costs increase for some reason, so even if there's a big increase in costs, profit maximizing firms here, okay, produced by MC equals MR, will still take them to quantity level Q1 and price P1. So even though this is a substantial increase in costs, there is no change in price as long as the costs increase within the vertical section. And that's another way to understand why there's price rigidity here. Okay? So, if we're trying to, if we're trying to understand the conduct of firms, well, this is a good example of competitive oligopoly. And with competitive oligopoly, there are two options. Either to keep, compete on price, which is terrible for the firm, because it leads to a massive price war that everyone tries to undercut each other. But it's great for the consumer, because the consumer will benefit from lower prices. The low-cost airline industry is a great example of how price wars have benefited the consumer. But because price wars are not in producers' interests, it's not in the interest of firms, you tend to see firms compete on, compete on non-price factors, such as you know, service quality, uh, maybe by offering discounts and promotions, maybe by advertising or trying to build a brand image. You tend to see a lot of non-price competition in competitive oligopoly. This is much more common than going for a price war. Okay? So that's the basic understanding of oligopoly using kink demand curve theory. This notion of interdependence is so important, and this is one way of mapping how firms operate when there is uncertainty and interdependence. That leads to price rigidity. Okay, so even though firms want to profit max, they must consider the expected reactions of rivals. They can't just do their own thing gung-ho and leave it there. Next video, game theory. See you then.